Pushback and Startup, Some Pitfalls and Hazards Although you probably have done several pushbacks and startups as first officer before, things change rather drastically now you are the commander of a flight. Especially the legal aspect now becomes important. So take special care of these items and remember to monitor your first officer whenever he or she is PF. Following is a list of aspects you know are required to have a deeper insight into. Ground Checks Legally it is of the utmost importance that you receive a clear signal from the ground crew that your aircraft is secured and ready to be pushed back. Once you receive this clearance and you start pushing back, you have full responsibility for the flight. You need to be sure about the following. All doors and hatches are closed and locked. The steering bypass pin is properly installed. All ground checks completed. Area behind and around the aircraft is clear. Rudder pedals. Not keeping all feet away from brake pedals and flat on the cockpit floor during pushback unless intentionally applying or releasing the brakes, for example park brake. Communication. Communication with the ground crew is of the utmost importance. Remember that communication is transferring a message and making sure the message has been understood by the receiving party. An additional factor in our kind of operation is the vast range of nationalities among the ground engineers as well as pilots. Most of us do not have English as our mother tongue. Therefore standard phraseology is the key to successful communication. The use of brakes released and brakes set to on are recommended over the use of often barely understandable phrases such as brakes on or brakes off. Note, in case you were to notice a break in communication due to a language barrier between your flight deck and the ground crew it might be a good idea to revert to whatever wording your engineer is using for example if he says brakes off please reply with brakes off. Communication, ATC. Not monitoring both VHF-1 and the flight interphone for the duration of pushback and startup. Use of the intercom switch for communications on the flight interphone is preferred. Distraction. Allowing distractions to interfere with the pushback or engine start. For example, doing the PA during engine start is not a good idea. Releasing ground crew. After pushback and engine start and when the parking brake has been set, the ground engineer in charge will be waiting for your signal to be released. Make sure both the tractor slash tow bar and the ground engineer are well clear of the aircraft before asking for taxi clearance. Note as well that you, or your PF, need to visually verify that the engineer is holding the steering bypass pin in his hand. Therefore, do not move the aircraft until you have positively confirmed that the engineer is clear and, if appropriate, you have been shown the steering bypass pin. Taxiing As an Airbus first officer, you will have had plenty of practice at taxiing. You may also have learned a few bad habits so a review of techniques is worthwhile. Make sure you have reviewed standard operating procedures or normal operations procedures and supplementary techniques FCTM, as they provide good guidelines for everything regarding taxiing your aircraft properly. Remember that, before you start taxiing, you have to make sure all escape slides are armed as this is a legal requirement before the aircraft starts moving at its power. Always make sure that the aircraft is moving before initiating even the gentlest of turns. Otherwise undue strain is put upon the nose gear leg, the steering gear, tires, etc. Similarly, always be gentle and progressive with the steering. Too tight a turn, at low speed in particular, will cause the aircraft to pivot about the inner, relative to the turn, main gear, again placing an enormous strain due to side loads on the gear leg and causing the tires to be scrubbed. Note, turn over the centerline to save runway length for takeoff. Given the unusually high strain this puts on all parts of the landing gear, this should be considered carefully, unless dictated by an exceptionally short runway. In all other cases, a standard lineup has been taken into account. Note, the mistake often made is to turn over the centerline to save runway length for takeoff. Given the unusually high strain this puts on all parts of the landing gear, this should be avoided unless dictated by an exceptionally short runway. Riding the brakes will lead to high brake temperatures. Brakes should be applied to reduce speed and then allow the aircraft to accelerate again, repeating the cycle as required. It is standard operating procedure on all fleets to let the aircraft accelerate to 30 knots taxi speed and then to use one brake application to decelerate again to 10 knots taxi speed. As with during any long vehicle or towing a trailer, the inner wheels in a turn cut in or describe a smaller turn radius. Do not be tempted to cut corners and be aware constantly of the overall size of your aircraft. Be aware also of the limits of visibility of each particular model and in turns to the right make sure that the first officer clears you visually to the right, just like you would clear him in a turn to the left. These callouts should be made verbally so they are recorded on the CVR in case an incident occurs. Entering a stand at certain airports is rather akin to parking in a municipal car park. 
vehicles of all shapes and sizes abound and if the vehicles are stationary the chances are that the personnel who arrived in them are not. Caution a good lookout and proper control of your speed should ensure a safe arrival. Whenever you are moving onto a stand and you are not sure you have sufficient clearance to proceed on both sides of your airplane, stop and call a marshaller. Beware at this juncture of the helpful but unqualified souls who will appear out of the woodwork to marshal you onto the stand, only to disappear when something goes wrong. A qualified marshaller is required by the airline as well as many airports to guide you in. The same applies if the stand guidance is unserviceable or switched off. Do not take any risks. Do not taxi close behind other aircraft as jet blasts can be damaging and any slush or similar may be blown up onto your aircraft causing you severe problems. On a similar theme, be careful using breakaway thrust, a light aircraft, especially if going downwind or downhill, because it will move away happily at idle thrust only. At the other end of the scale, a heavy aircraft moving off into the wind or uphill will need a considerable increase in N1 to enable initial movement. Try to limit thrust as much as possible to reduce the potential blast damage injury and also to limit the possibility of FOD. An engine at idle power is an effective vacuum cleaner, one at a high N1 setting is devastatingly efficient at picking up anything in its area of influence. Even a simple newspaper or plastic bag can cause serious problems if ingested. Note, for the Airbus fleet, supplementary techniques and FCTM recommend not to use more than 40% N1 thrust in order to start taxi. Note, standard operating procedures prohibit the use of engine settings above 40% N1 when on the ground for this reason. Handling reverse thrust. A few words and some research on the subject will be beneficial as this will ensure correct usage and understanding of the benefits of reverse thrust correctly applied and the problems created if it is not. Here are some things to think about. At N1 speeds above idle the engine is producing proportionally more thrust than it is at idle. A consequence of this is that if reverse thrust is cancelled before the N1s have diminished to idle, an extra amount of unwanted forward thrust is created. This will diminish as the N1s decelerate to idle. In this instance, the premature cancelling of reverse thrust with the N1 still at a higher than idle value will result in a change from a braking force to an accelerating force. This imposition of an accelerating force is all too often masked by the auto brake which now has to dramatically increase the amount of wheel braking occurring to maintain its appropriate rate of deceleration. This will lead to increased brake and tire wear and probably missed runway exits due to the landing roll being extended. It will also lead to brakes being hotter than they otherwise would have been had the proper technique been used. This premature cancellation of reverse thrust is probably the single most common handling error during landing. Correct technique. After use of reverse thrust smoothly select reverse idle by 70 knots, allow the N1S to decay to idle, and then cancel reverse. Standard operating procedures recommend the use of low auto brake and idle reverse unless otherwise dictated for security reasons. Therefore on many occasions, it has been witnessed that pilots, due to wet runway, will revert to using auto brake low with full reverse to reduce the landing distance. This however only results in less brake wear but it will not reduce your landing distance. Let's think about it. The auto brake system demands a certain deceleration rate only on the A320 auto brake low gives you 1.7 meters per second while the auto brake medium gives you a 3 meter per second deceleration rate. When using low and switching to full reverse, the only result you will have is that the brake pressure will release to maintain the same deceleration rate. So if you want to reduce your landing distance you will have to use auto brake medium or revert to manual braking. When doing so it is always a good idea to use full reverse thrust to help the brakes in doing their job. On a slippery runway where the anti-skid system is modulating brake pressure to give maximum retardation for the available braking coefficient, a significant push from the early cancellation of reverse thrust will cause an increase in the distance required to bring the aircraft either to a halt or taxi speed. In extremist, this may be more than the remaining runway available. This is because the auto brake, or you, if you have elected to brake manually, is prevented by the runway surface conditions and the anti-skid unit from increasing brake pressure to increase the retardation rate as it is already at its maximum for the available braking coefficient. Conversely, retaining even reverse idle thrust during decelerating on a slippery runway will reduce the landing roll as the effect of the reverse thrust is unaffected by surface conditions. Some landings do not require the use of full reverse thrust, merely the selection of reverse idle. There is no doubt that passenger comfort is improved and fuel burn and engine wear and tear are reduced with the use of idle rather than full reverse thrust. To reduce unnecessary brake where it should be associated with landings on long runways without intermediate turnoff points where it is possible to land without the use of auto brake. This should not be done on wet or contaminated runways. 
Note also that some airfields are particularly noise sensitive and may request the use of reverse idle during night hours. The use of reverse idle, to comply with local rules, may mean performance constraints that require the use of a higher auto brake setting for landing. Do remember that thrust reversers are not 100% efficient as only fan air is reversed on bypass engines. The exhaust gases from the N2 spool, the hot section, are unaffected. At 150 knots, a typical reverse thrust output is about 40% of the equivalent forward thrust.